Ähm, mein Name ist Sonja Lahnstein und ich, bin, ich lebe in Hamburg. Aber ich begrüße Sie heute hier, obwohl wir selber zu Gast sind. Ich bin ähm, Vorsitzende eines äh, Vereins oder des Vereins zur Förderung des Israel Museums in Jerusalem. Und äh, Herr Beck, Michael Beck ist unser langjähriges Mitglied und Unterstützer. Und wir sind hier mit einer wunderbaren Gruppe von äh, Mitgliedern und Förderern des Israel Museums. Vielleicht darf ich Sie alle bitten, einmal kurz aufzustehen, damit man sieht, wie viele wir sind. Wenn Sie mögen, wir sind hier alle zu Gast. <lacht> ja. Vielen, vielen Dank. Und äh, wir verdanken es, wir haben das sozusagen mit gemeinsamen Kräften gemacht, aber wir verdanken es der unglaublichen Gastfreundschaft, der Virtualität und der Kreativität und Spontaneität von Michael äh, Beck, äh, dass wir hier zu Gast sein dürfen. Ähm, unser heutiges Thema haben wir auch gemeinsam ähm, erarbeitet und äh, war auch nicht so schwer, aber ähm, es heißt Die Frauen von Chagall. Bella, Virginia und Vava, Fragezeichen, Musen und oder Managerin. Und es soll ja heißen, dass es ja nicht darum geht, wie diese drei Frauen im Leben von Chagall eine große Rolle gespielt haben, sondern auch darum, welche Art diese Rolle war, warum ist es eigentlich, dass man immer von Frauen als Musen hinter großen männlichen Künstlern spricht, ähm, Inspiration, Models, Musen, äh, äh, hinter jedem großen Künstler eine Frau oder waren sie damals auch schon diejenigen, die eigentlich auch zum großen Teil dazu beigetragen haben, dass solche Künstler äh, tatsächlich auch so wirken konnten und wie ist es heute? Und äh, dazu, äh, bevor ich noch kurz zum Israel Museum und dem Grund, warum wir hier sind äh, und wie die Verbindung ist, komme, Dazu äh, geht es auch natürlich darum, welche Rolle Frauen heute in der Kunst, nicht nur als Künstlerin, sondern auch als Managerin, Gestalterin spielen. Und wir haben hier halt zwei wunderbare, ich will nicht sagen Exemplare, <lacht> <lacht> sondern zwei wunderbare Frauen. Und äh, jetzt begrüße ich auf Englisch. Uh, Ronit, uh, uh, the curator of the Israel Museum, and Nixonic, the uh, curator for prints and drawings of the Israel Museum. It's her first trip uh, from Israel to anywhere in two years. And uh, we are so happy. It's also a first for all of us, actually. It's the first trip for the German friends. And we are so happy, Ronit, that you have come with us for this trip and that you are uh, today with us. And I also uh, am so happy uh, that we have uh, Diandra Donecker with us, who is now the managing director of uh, Griesebach, Villa Griesebach. Uh, and maybe let me just say a few words first uh, to introduce Ronit. I'm sorry, I've spoken in German, okay. but I mean, uh, you d I know you don't speak German, but uh, for our audience. And I would just like say, to say that, Ronit, you've been, I think, at the museum for 20 years now? 24. 24 <laughs> years, yes. And uh, she's curator of prints and drawings at the Israel Museum and extremely well acquainted with Chagall, of course, also. And uh, she's done a lot of exhibitions, curated uh, um, many exhibitions and catalogs particularly on image of God in Jewish and Israeli art, on German board Israeli artists, on Israeli women in art, on Palestinian artists. You have worked with Palestinian artists too, in particular Azim Abu Shakra, and also in Tour 10, uh, with a, in connection with the major donation to the museum, you have particularly curated a major exhibition with works of the German Israeli artists Jakob Steinhardt, and you're doing many other things. You told me also that you are chair of the workers' union or the uh, <laughs> trade union at the Israel Museum. Diandra uh, uh, Donecker is vielleicht die jüngste um, ja. Geschäftsführerin, Managerin, <laughs> sie sagt das ganz uh, klar und uh, spontan. Um, Sie, natürlich haben sie äh, Kunstgeschichte studiert, aber auch Jura und Literatur. 
Und sie waren ja schon im British Museum äh, in London und im Metropolitan New York City aktiv und haben gearbeitet, auch für Christie's. Äh, sind seit vier oder fünf Jahren bei Villa Griesebach, erst als Abteilungsleiterin und jetzt als Geschäftsführerin. Danke. Herzlichen Glückwunsch dazu und, und herzlich willkommen. Äh, Michael Beck vorzustellen hier, glaube ich, wäre wie Eulen äh, nach Athen zu tragen. Ich glaube, ich muss dich wirklich nicht vorstellen. Äh, es ist, äh, glaube ich, jeden in Tegernsee und weit darüber hinaus bekannt. Äh, für uns ist Michael Beck, also für mich, ein persönlicher guter Freund und immer jemand, wirklich, dem ich mich anvertrauen konnte, aber der auch Feuer gefangen hat. Ähm, für Israel und auch äh, für die jüdische Geschichte, äh, für, die, äh, für die Gegenwart des jüdischen Volks, aber auch für Israel speziell. Und all das ist wie nirgendwo auf der Welt eigentlich nicht nur das, aber auch das im Israel-Museum in Jerusalem verinnerlicht und äh, zu besichtigen. Wir waren auch gemeinsam dort. Und äh, vielleicht darf ich Ihnen auch zum Israel-Museum noch ein paar Worte sagen. Zum einen gibt es eine große äh, Verbindung, ähm, weil das äh, Israel Museum, was ja zu den, äh, jetzt wieder im Newsweek äh, äh, in der großen Liste äh, bestätigt, äh, zu den 20 wichtigsten Museen auf dieser Welt zählt, nicht nur, äh, weil es über 500.000 äh, Kunstobjekte hat, und von Prähistorie bis zur äh, Gegenwart und Zeitgenössischen geht, sondern wirklich für den ganzen äh, mittleren, äh, Nahen und Mittleren Osten eigentlich ein Leuchtturm für universelle Kultur und für interkulturelle Verständigung unter anderem ist. Ähm, und außerdem hat das, ist das Museum, das im 1965 gegründet wurde, von dem damaligen legendären Bürgermeister äh, Teddy Kollek ähm, und Marc Chagall die gemeinsam sozusagen den ersten Spatenstich gemacht haben. Und das Museum hat eine fantastische Sammlung, die von Ida, der Tochter von Marc Chagall, dem Museum vermacht worden ist. Ähm, äh, eine, eine einmalige Sammlung von Chagall, die wir, die Freunde des Israel Museums, im Jahr 2011 in einer großen gemeinsam kuratierten Ausstellung mit dem Museum Kunstforum in, nach Hamburg gebracht haben. Das Besondere an diesem Museum ist nicht nur alles äh, atemberaufende Lage und Architektur und der Skulpturengarten, sondern es ist das Museum mit der größten Jugendabteilung aller großen Museen auf der Welt. Und dort gibt es ein Programm, das heißt Bridging the Gap. Und dieses äh, Programm ist, wie wir schreiben, auch Baustein für eine friedliche Zukunft. Warum? Das ist ein einzige existierende Programm seit äh, fast 30 Jahren vor Ort in Jerusalem, direkt dort, wo der Brennpunkt ist, wo die vielen Kulturen, die Ethnien, die Religionen aufeinandertreffen äh, und alle Konflikte sozusagen sich dort kristallisieren, existiert dieses Programm für palästinensische und jüdische Kinder. Jedes Jahr ununterbrochen, trotz Terror und trotz äh, Krieg. Und Bedrohung, ähm, ungefähr 70, 80 Kinder, die Hälfte jüdisch aus Westjerusalem, die Hälfte äh, palästinensisch aus Ostjerusalem. Jede Woche äh, treffen sie, sie werden abgeholt, äh, sie essen gemeinsam, sie werden äh, durch die Sperren, durch die äh, Abgrenzungen und zum Teil Schikanen zum Museum gebracht und dort arbeiten sie gemeinsam an einem Thema, das die Kinder sowohl die palästinensischen als auch die jüdischen schwer beschäftigt. Ähm, mein Zuhause oder Arche Noah oder meine Träume. Und es ist zum ersten Mal, dass sie sich dort kennenlernen und dass sie lernen, das sind Kinder ähm, wie wir. Und äh, wir, dieses Programm schafft es wirklich, Vorurteile abzubauen. Ich könnte Ihnen jetzt stundenlang natürlich darüber erzählen. Ähm, ich kann Sie nur bitten, dieses Programm, was wirklich einmalig ist, und es ist anders als was ich oft angesprochen werde, ach, das ist wie Barmbäums, ost west -Dieber. Nein, es ist anders, weil es in Jerusalem ist, wirklich dort, wo es am allerschwierigsten so etwas zu machen und wo es am allerwichtigsten ist. Sie haben alle so einen kleinen Flyer da und äh, wir würden uns sehr freuen, wenn Sie sich das einmal kurz durchlesen. Es ist wenig Text, 
auf unserer Website kann man viel dazu sagen. Michael war da und war sofort, hat Feuer gefangen und viele andere Freunde hier. Ähm, bitte denken Sie daran, wenn es dort möglich ist, dort wo es am schwersten ist, ist es dann überall möglich und wir haben es alle nötig. Vielen Dank. Mhm. Thank you very much, Sonja, <clears throat> and you made a point and you made it now very, very clear to everybody why Chagall is my first exhibition. <laughs> Another reason, besides that a Chagall was hanging over the bed when I was a young child. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, my parents sold it when I was seven. But if you look at the book, you can see it. It's, a, it's a, a fee which is flying over the city of uh, Paris. And mm -hmm. she was always over my head and can brought you, luck can and you, fortune you. to me. Okay. Um, you, because you, Chagall is somehow a kind of old fashioned artist. Uh, so I'm very much interested in contemporary art. So for me, it's a very, uh, very conservative exhibition, and I love it. I, 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 rec uh, I found again my conservative love of painting. Um, of course, we have a plan, we three, how we want to proceed, but I like to change plans. <laughs> and if you allow, I would start to read to you uh, from uh, two books in German, uh, I hope I find it now, because it's a changed plan, yeah. uh, which should, yeah. maybe is a good introduction in a, in a kind of a talk about the women of Chagall, what they, what they did to him, and what Aha. they <laughs> belong to them. But you see, it's the wrong book. so. Uh, here we are. Was ist das? Du lässt mich rasch ein, schaust mich an. Woher kommst du denn angereist? Also es geht um eine Konversation zwischen Bella, seiner ersten Frau, und Chagall. Meinst du, mit Paketen könne man nur vom Bahnhof kommen? Rate, was ist heute für ein Tag? Frag mich etwas Leichteres. Ich weiß nie, welcher Tag wir haben. Nein, nicht Wochentag. Heute ist doch dein Geburtstag. Verblüfft stehst du da, Chagall, also Bella schreibt, wenn ich dir mitgeteilt hätte, der Zar persönlich sei in unserer Stadt, wärst du nicht überraschter gewesen. Woher weißt du das? Rasch falte ich meine Tücher auseinander, hänge sie an die Wände, lege eines über den Tisch, breite meine Decke über dein Bett. Du aber ergreifst blitzschnell eine Leinwand, stellst sie auf und sagst, rühr dich nicht, bleib genau so, wie du jetzt dastehst. Die Blumen sind noch in meinen Händen. Ich bin mitten in der Bewegung, möchte die Blumen rasch ins Wasser stellen, damit sie nicht welken. Aber dann vergesse ich sie. Du bist über deine Leinwand hergefallen, dass sie unter deinen Händen erzittert, tauchst ein, drückst Farbe, rote, blaue, weiße, verschleppst mich mit einem Strom von Farben. Plötzlich fühle ich mich... Wie von der Erde weggehoben, du stößt dich mit einem Bein vom Boden ab, als sei es dir in deinem kleinen Zimmer zu eng geworden. Du schwingst dich empor, fliegst zur Decke hinauf, dein Kopf dreht sich, du verdrehst auch den meinen, schmiegst dich hinter meine Ohren und flüstert mir etwas zu. Ich lausche, als sängest du mit deiner weichen, tiefen Stimme ein Lied für mich, in deinen Augen sehe ich den Widerhall deines Liedes. Vereint schweben wir über dem geschmückten Zimmer, kommen zum Fenster, wollen hindurch. Draußen ruft uns eine Wolke, ein Stück blauer Himmel. Die mit den bunten Tüchern behängten Wände drehen sich, verwirren uns. Wir fliegen hinaus über Felder voller Blumen, über verschlossene Häuschen, über Dächer, Höfe, Kirchen. Wie gefällt dir mein Bild? Plötzlich stehst du wieder auf deinen Füßen, schaust auf dein Bild, auf mich, trittst von der Staffelei zurück und wieder näher hin. Da ist noch viel zu tun. So kann man es nicht lassen, nicht wahr? Sag, darf ich noch weiterarbeiten? Du allein redest, wartest, hast Angst, was ich sagen werde. Oh, 
Es ist sehr gut, du bist so schön weggeflogen. Wir wollen es der Geburtstag nennen. Jetzt ist dir leichter ums Herz. Kommst du morgen wieder? Ich will noch ein Bild malen. Ähm, das zeigt so ein bisschen... Englisch. Okay. Yeah, you have not understood this, but uh, it shows a little bit a situation how uh, Bella describes how Chagall was painting inspired by her in a very short moment. But now I have to read you a text from some years later. Der 25-jährige Marc Chagall und seine zwei Jahre jüngere Verlobte Bella hatten sich seit fast zwei Jahren nicht gesehen, als der in Paris lebende Künstler 1912 von ihr einen Brief erhielt, der sein bisheriges Werk einer Generalkritik unterzog. Bella schrieb, du bist noch sehr jung, also sie war ja noch jünger, ja? drängst danach, alles zum Ausdruck zu bringen, alles Verehrte und Unsterbliche. Man hat den Eindruck, du meinst mit deiner Kenntnis des Geheiligsten erstaunen zu können. Was folgt daraus? Ein Übermaß an Dingen und Fakten, die in keinerlei Verbindung stehen oder Bezug zueinander haben. Sie sah die Ursache für Chagalls Schwächen in seinem Mangel an Erfahrung und machte seine distanzierte Herangehensweise dafür verantwortlich. Es fehlt diese Anteilnahme, mit der man das Sakrale zur Geltung bringen muss. Du darfst Menschen nicht erschrecken, ihnen mit Furcht und Tadel den Boden unter den Füßen wegziehen. Das ist geradezu, verzeih mir, primitiv und ziemlich kindisch. Welche Muse in der Geschichte schrieb je solche Worte an einen Künstler? Uh, so she is criticizing Chagall 1912 in a very, very harsh way. And so uh, I think uh, that Bella was really outstanding person. On the one hand, in the first text you understood that she was inspiring him in a way, just arriving, being there, beauty with the, with the flowers in her hand, and he said, stop it, stop like this, I have to paint you. And then he got in the, in the act of action painting, actually. Fantastic, these two flying uh, over the roofs and being in Chagall's world. And on the second uh, quotation, she is really criticizing him harsh and telling him, This is not the way you will be successful. And of course, this is outstanding. I actually don't know a second uh, wife or muse who was, and that's why I quoted this, on the one hand, the muse, and on the other hand, the manager in, uh, and the manager. Okay, this is the, uh, in English we don't have manager in. Okay, the manager. And uh, um, I would like to give the word uh, to Ronik, who is from us three, the Chagall expert, and uh, to, to listen to your opinion, especially because we don't have only Bella. Yeah. We have uh, three women who were important for him, and each of these women in a different way. Yeah. Actually, it's not only three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> it's not only three because when we think hmm? about Chagall between the muse and the manager, we have to start from his grandmother. Oh yeah. And I was so happy to see this wonderful early rare uh, 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 drawing. Yeah, because if if we think about the first woman, Ronnie, can you speak up a little bit, please? Yeah. If we want to to speak about the first woman in Chagall life, actually we have to speak about his grandmother. Uh, and he descri describes her very warmly. She was one, I think, it, the most, the first significant uh, f a figure, female figure in his life. Um, and he describes her as her, a kind woman who is reading uh, Yiddish, uh, Yiddish books, uh, prayer books. Um, Because, because there were special prayer books in Yiddish, so the women could, will be able to, to read them. And the second uh, a woman in his life was, oh, actually, she is the first, 
his his uh, mother. mother. Yeah, and he also describes her ma his mother as his first supporter. I mean, she was the first uh, the first woman or the first um, um, the first one that he told her that he wants to be an artist. Of course, she didn't like the idea, okay? So this is a kind of a manager. But she was his, also his muse, because he, he thought that she, she, gave, she gave him his, like, his spirit, his uh, free spirit character. Mm -hmm. uh, and she used to sing with him, and uh, of course she did, as every Jewish mother, she didn't want him to be an artist, but at yes. the end, she was the, the one who enabled him to, to study art also, already in Vitebsk. Mm -hmm. So she, these two women, mother and grandmother, they were the first youth and managers. And, yeah? I never actually understood how he could achieve to be an artist, because as I read and heard, he came from a very, very poor family. Yeah. And you all know you have to live from something. So he must be very, very, have a, lived a very, very basic life yeah. to have the time and uh, some money to s study art. Yeah. Indeed, he was very poor. And, and although he was very poor, I think he was very convinced in himself that he should be an artist mm -hmm. and I think this, it, bra it broke all the rules. I mean, his mother uh, helped him to, 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 to first, to have his first lessons uh, also in Yuda Penn's, uh, uh, his first teacher of, for art. Uh, and then, well, we can say that he chose the, the right woman, eh? the, the right wife, because Bella w came from a, a very wealthy family. Mm -hmm. So I think it helped. Mm -hmm. Actually, all his three wives, Bella, Virginia, and uh, Vava, uh, Valentina, came from a wealthy uh, families. Mm -hmm. So it always, but yeah. When I read the book, uh, uh, or when I remember what I read in the book, if I yeah. read it right, it was <laughs> Bella, because she, Bella uh, describes very, very, very vividly yeah. how they met for the first time. And yeah. she writes how she fell in love with this crazy person. Yeah. So I don't know whether he really took her or whether she, she took him. We'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but actually, I think that Bella was his muse. And I think that she was his muse. She, she came like his ideal love. He, the, the, she became an idea, actually. Mm -hmm. And although she, she, she died in, in young age, in 44, uh, she, I think that she continued to be this ideal love, ideal image of love. Mm -hmm. But very quickly, and I'm not criticizing, after her death, he had his second wife, Virginia, who was uh, uh, the daughter of a diplomat. She already had a daughter, and actually Ida hired uh, Virginia to help him and to support him in, you know, taking care of all the things. And and among them is to illustrate his and publish his wife, uh, his Bella's um, books. And I'm I'm very happy that you that you chose to to read the. A paragraph from uh, from um, uh, from Burning Lights from his her first book. She had actually three books. She had Burning Light, Burning Lights, First Encounter, and uh, from my. Mm. Uh, okay, and we have the actually we have the the illustrations for the for her books. For ah, the the third one is. A first encounter, and this is the, and this book is describing her uh, first encounter with Chagall, of course. And we, uh, thanks to Ida Chagall, their daughter, and the mother of Meret Meyer, uh, we have the the original drawings that Chagall made uh, for these uh, three books. And uh, so Virginia helped him to to publish and to finish this project of illustrating Bella's books. 
and and they at the end uh, they married and they had a son David uh, and this all this happens like one year after Bella's death uh, and they were married for seven years and I think Virginia was different than Bella she was you know she she devoted herself to Chagall I mean I think all, Bella also was devoted but she was really as you mentioned she was very like I think she was independent, she was, uh, she was also a writer, a Yiddish writer, mm -hmm. um, and Virginia, since she met Chagall, she was really completely devoted to his, uh, his work, to his life, uh, and they stayed together for seven years. And when they separated, he had his uh, third wife, Vava, but may also I in, uh, interrupt you because yeah. you're right uh, saying when they separated, yeah. she went away, yeah. and she left him behind. Yeah. Because I think this is very important because there are men, I guess there are women as well, who cannot stay alone. Yeah. So Chagall is a good example of that yeah. of this man, but also this artist who that. always yeah. needed uh, uh, a partner. Yeah. And in yeah. this case, it was not only a partner, but it was her, his love affair or his love or yeah. his marriage. Yeah. yeah, I think that it was uh, th there was uh, there was also love, uh, always love, and also assistance and also muse. And Virginia wasn't a manager, and yes, she left him for a photographer who who actually came to photograph their <laughs> life, and then she left uh, she for promised. with this photographer. And then again, Ida brought him the new assistant, and this was Vava. <laughs> and, well and, organized. Yeah. <laughs> and she was. Uh, she came from a Russian Jewish family, a very wealthy one, the Brod Brodsky uh, family. They were like uh, businessmen from Russia, and and she became the ultimate manager. Yeah. She yeah. was, yeah. She was managing him through mm -hmm. the end of life. She managed his career. She mm -hmm. told him what to do, mm -hmm. what to paint. Mm -hmm. She, yeah. She organized his life. She organized his everyday creativity, if I may, may say so. And um, and I think that now, the manager of Chagall like heritage is Merit Meyer, who is also very active. Mm -hmm and very significant because she keeps very carefully his heritage. I mean, she's involved in everything. She's actually, she's the, the daughter of, uh, of Ida Chagall and of Franz Meyer, who was his, um, his, his art historian. And uh, so she knows, actually she knows everything about Chagall uh, works and she's, uh, and she's, she goes into details, and uh, as I said before, the, the, the fact that she took out from your exhibition only one uh, uh, art, work of art, this is, yeah, you can be very happy. Uh, because, yeah, she's really checking everything. The, of course, the dates, the, the, mm -hmm. the titles, and of course, the, uh, the authenticity of the works. Mm -hmm. And I think that she's doing it uh, in a very clever way, yeah. And one question from my side, when we talk about like the grandmother, the mother, um, the three women in his life, what was the role of the daughter? Was it a muse and a manager as well? So, I don't know. I know that I but know. she delivered the muses in a way. Yeah, she, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. she was the manager. Yeah, yes, yeah. In a way. yeah. I think she she mm -hmm. managed him in a way. Uh, she's a really important donor of the Israel Museum. She donated. She was a, f a very close friend of Teddy Kolek, the the mayor of Jerusalem, and actually the the founder of the Israel Museum. And she, and Teddy Kolek convinced her to donate her her mother, uh, her. Uh, father's illustrate, illustrating to her mother's mm -hmm. books, and she donated us the, these important drawings. The, uh, um, and, she, uh, and she convinced another, some other friends of the Chagall family to donate other important uh, paintings to the museum. 
And so in a, yeah, in a sense, she was also uh, managing his career and, and his uh, legacy. Mm -hmm. If we just look, or you can see the illustration in the beginning here, the left one observing the whole scene that her father is painting well is Ida, yeah. the young. If you look at mm -hmm. it, she's really standing there and looking already what's going on and uh, from there she went and... And she had two daughters. She had, she had Meret and, she, and her twin sister is Bella. Ah. And I th yeah, and Bella is... I th I, I've heard that she, she has like... A, she's living in New York and she has a, um, a special Gosh. shop, a special like flower boutique. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, it's very nice to see because all Chagall's uh, bouquet uh, mm -hmm. and his love to f of flowers, so mm -hmm. it's very nice. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you were talking about other uh, women in Chagall's life, so these are the officials, because mm -hmm. I want to make a comparison with the, uh, the, the second grand master of the 21st, 20th century, the first half of the 20th century, who uh, was much more uh, attacked to the change of new women yeah. as Chagall because he always changed the, the style with a new uh, partner. He was married sometimes, I'm talking of course of Pablo Picasso yeah. who had seven official uh, women yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. or partners, yes, uh, and uh, the seven, when he changed the, what he actually did, besides of one, he was the one who decided, now it's enough, I need some new inspiration. Yeah. So he left uh, his partner. The only one who left him was uh, Francois. Yeah. Uh, Francois Chilot, she was the only one who said, vice versa, no, no, I leave you. And he never forgave her. <laughs> uh, and uh, I visited uh, Francois in... Uh, New York, and okay. it was a very nice encounter. She's a great lady. She's still living in New York. She's an artist herself. Mm -hmm. And so we did also an exhibition, and she came to, uh, to Düsseldorf for her, I think it was her 80th birthday. Mm -hmm. And actually, I didn't know that she, she's coming to Düsseldorf for her 80th birthday. Can you imagine? <laughs> François Chilot. Uh, okay, we did the party. Uh, but <laughs> I was wondering why her son, Claude Picasso, uh, Paloma Picasso, her daughter, weren't there. Yes? So she was celebrating with her exhibition, so she was also very eager as an artist. It was more important to have an exhibition with us than to celebrate with her family. That's nice. But to see, to, now to comparison with the, yeah. with the partners of Chagall, his wives, and Picasso, I, I mean, I he never changed his style. And I wanted to say, as yeah. what you said with Vava, who then organized his life, his work, his everything. She also kept the people away. You could not enter the studio anymore without... Uh, she was like has, a Cerberus. <laughs> and what I heard, and this is a true criticism, that she also told him, don't paint the stettel, all this dark yeah. cottages and the poor people. We need colors, we need flowers. Paint Saint Paul de Vence. That's something <laughs> Gerhard would buy, eh? <laughs> for example. And uh, uh, it's much, much colorful and nice on the wall. And uh, I heard this story also. What do you yeah. think about it? Okay, actually, Chagall painted uh, France and Paris before him, long, uh, before he met Va uh, Vava, of course. I also heard this story. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe I think he never left the shtetl, the the small town he was mm -hmm. uh, born in. But uh, I think she had a very significant influence on his later late period. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's we, we can't ignore it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine any artist who would paint something he would not stand behind. Yes. Yeah. This is always, yes, actually yesterday we had a tour through the uh, Pinacothek and the guide standing in front of a late Picasso, he said, look at this late Picasso. Yeah. Uh, I think it looks like that his art dealer said, we need now 20 Picassos, <laughs> paint quickly. 
And that's, mm -hmm. I think this is stupid. This is, I, I don't think that Picasso would have painted something he would not be convinced of. Yeah, and so also Chagall. Exactly, that's yeah. the, the pride of the artist. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so many uh, um, ideas in the world that something is painted by an artist of aspects of mm -hmm. money. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a late work, I mean, all painters look at the late works. I mean, they are different because you're not anymore in the power you have painted lifetime. A good example for me is Emil Nolde, <coughs> who has painted wonderful works in, uh, in, the, li in the late years. Yeah. Uh, all the other expressionists is more a catastrophe, so you can be lucky that uh, August Macri died in the war 1914 and <laughs> Franz Marc 16. I mean, had, uh, good for, for their work. If you look at Gabriel Münter's la, uh, late work, for example. Yeah? Look you, at Matisse. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is a, and also <laughs> Picasso. I mean, I, it's different, the work, but it's, uh, it's, it's true. It's still what they wanted to paint. And this is the question I have with Chagall, because you read and you hear all the time that Vava, I mean, to <laughs> exaggerate it, said, now, away with this dark painting, you, now before you get lunch, <laughs> paint the flowers to life. And what's so interesting for me is that when I um, read the topic of our talk, I was um, in the first moment thinking that this topic means that we are talking about the limitation of women always being in the second row or, row, um, or not having a big uh, chance to um, show themselves. So I think she was not in the second role. She was very important in um, telling him maybe what would sell, but what makes sense to his oeuvre as well. Mm -hmm. And this is something I find interesting with your biography as well, because you are coming from an artist background and you have a mother and a, fa um, a father. Right. And how <laughs> was that? How was that? Because I have a father and a mother, <laughs> yes, you're right. <laughs> yes, but how was it? Yeah, that's interesting because, of course, I can tell you from first hand. In, my, in the case of my family, it was definitely that my mother was not inspiring my father. He was inspired by uh, different things. But she was the manager in that kind that she organized the life. My father could not, he could not, uh, <laughs> how is it, steer, steer uh, an egg. Heißt das so? Yeah. Also ein Spiegelei yeah. konnte er nicht mal machen. Also, he was not, not able to survive in daily life. And this was the part of my mother. My father was from morning to evening playing. Playing music, playing tennis, playing chess and playing on the, on the papers with colors. And my mother was organizing uh, the life. Mm. So th this is definitely, she was definitely no news in the kind as, for example, Bella, which could be seen also maybe in this person, or indirectly. Uh, but, but I think that Chagall managers, <laughs> they were also muse because if you, you look at the, the, the female uh, figures in his uh, paintings, you, you can see when you can see Bella, you can see Virginia, and you can see Vava. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems that they place the, these two roles mm -hmm. uh, simultaneously. Mm -hmm. yeah, but and, but uh, Vava was um, the, the manager, mm -hmm. yeah, the manager, and, mm -hmm. and Bella was not so the, in, the, the inspiration uh, by the ladies in general compared between Picasso and Chagall was totally different because I think in Chagall you have not much erotic. No, don't forget that he <coughs> came from a very traditional family yeah. and a very traditional uh, he Jewish heritage. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he can't be Picasso. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, somehow. Also he has a mother and a grandmother <laughs> who watched. <laughs> who watched? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And Michael, I heard you. Your mother was an artist as well. Yeah. So you're not talking about a manager. She resigned being an artist instead of being a manager of your father. 
Exactly, yeah. She actually was the, uh, she, yeah, that's actually a good uh, moment to get in a bit different direction, mm -hmm. asking, for example, when we talk about moose, it's always female, <laughs> well, mostly. I mean, we've been yesterday the whole day in museums and we have seen only male artists besides of one, two, three examples. So uh, the question is how male was the art world? Of course it was. There were so few women artists during the last five centuries. It was a totally male world. But how is it changing now? And that's actually why we invited uh, Diandra, mm. who, uh, who made it directly in the top of, the, of our male world. And I <laughs> feel a little bit afraid <laughs> that now something could happen to us, to our... To our yes. <laughs> Don't be afraid, Michael. No, for you, of you not, but there are other examples. <laughs> no, I think this is really something that is so interesting in connecting, like looking to the past and the present in artist works and looking into the art market. Um, because when I'm looking into our catalogs, for example, and into actually every other catalog, we see um, it's like 85% male artists. Mm -hmm. And it's still like this. It's not only in the mm -hmm. 1980s. When we go through museums, it's 90% male artists as well. I think we cannot talk about the topic without, of course, looking into society and development of society. And it has always been a very male-dominated society, um, of course. Um, and women were more the ones doing the household for a long, long time. And I'm happy that there was this uh, movement of freeing women in the 60s and 70s. And then suddenly we see female artists arising a little bit, not much. And another interesting point is, and I do say this to invite you to bid in auctions because I rarely have any female clients. <laughs> um, all clients I have on the phone during auctions are men. Maybe Incredible. the woman is um, behind. sitting behind um, <laughs> And she says, the stop, husband. stop, stop! <laughs> yes, something like this. <laughs> and um, Christiane Zapp, you maybe have the same experience, I guess. Yeah. And I think perhaps 30 ladies were on the phone, and all over the time, only the gentlemen were. Yeah. Really? yeah. Sometimes so you have a souffleuse behind, and you hear <laughs> it. So it's a no, no, not more, not more. It's, it's, it's enough, it's enough to yeah. stop. And yeah. so it's always a souffleuse, but all the gentlemen are calling us, or yeah. I'm calling the gentlemen. Yeah. That's right. And, um, so I think, um, for example, like my appointment being head of Griesebach means a lot, not only for my life, but it's um, a decision. And I'm sure many of you know Mr. Uh, Bernd Schulz, a wonderful visionary uh, person. Um, he decided um, to pick me. So it was a white old man picking a young blonde girl being 29. And that's something I adore because we still need Yes, we still need men who pick women, and I think there are now <laughs> artists. It's like this. That's a nice. <laughs> it's a little bit like this, um, and there is an interesting, um, wie sagt man, Stiftung nochmal, a great foundation which is called Albright Foundation, and this is um, a name that is leaning towards a Madeleine Albright, but written with a double L. And um, this foundation tries to make clear that for every um, woman to be chosen into like the front row, whatever it is, it needs a man to make the decision still. And it's still like that a man picks a man. So the statistic calls it the Thomas uh, Prinzip. I don't know. The, yeah. Um, so it's always a man picking a man. And I think this is the one side. And the other side is the empowerment of uh, women. So I hope that today, if, um, for example, a woman would be an artist herself, like your mother, um, that maybe she says, 
learn cooking your egg and I'm um, going back to my work and I'm, I know that there are some artists in the room as well and I think it's still very difficult especially when you're a female artist and um, that's something so interesting about this topic um, it has always been, been and it's still. I would like to come back to your question uh, what, uh, how it was with my mother. So she was studying art in Leipzig then there was the war and then they fled to Tegernsee and here was a situation that my father decided to stop his business as a goldsmith uh, and to become a real artist. He always was interested in, uh, in painting and, uh, but this was a hobby and then in 1947 he decided to do this. And there was of course in that moment a need of financing. And, uh, so my mother had to keep the household and they were renting one room to guests who came here as, as in holidays. Tourists. Tourists. And my father, he was playing music for the uh, GIs and earned some money in, in that way. And of course through that there was all, also no space in the room. There was only one studio and this was occupied by my father. Uh, so it was, my mother never complained about this because she raised three, uh, ma uh, three human beings and uh, took care of a lot of animals, dogs and cats. And when there was the situation where we all were out of the house, she made the point and said, okay, I want to start painting again. And my father then said, okay, that's fine. Because actually, now I remember that my father always discussed the paintings with her. <laughs> so her opinion on his paintings was, was important for him. And so she, he immediately said, okay, yes, uh, we share the studio. But in a man's world, six days me and one day you. <laughs> or something like that, after cooking. Um, yes, please. I wanted, if, because we don't have so much time, I think we have just maybe for a quarter of an hour left, I wanted to ask uh, Ronit if she could tell us something about uh, the women in Israel. As I understand, there are many, many female artists in, uh, in Israel, and there are many uh, also directors of museums and so on. Would you say that in Israel, uh, in general, the situation for women in art and art business is better? Yes, I can say. Yeah, in Israel, in, in, I think in the last uh, maybe 30 years even, there are many, many artists which are prominent, which are you know, in the center of the art world. Uh, there are also collectors, female collectors, which are very uh, central. Uh, I can say that most of the curators in Israel are female. Um, and we ha now we have um, um, female uh, directors of museums. The, the f and we can say that the two uh, most important uh, female uh, directors it's of the Tel Aviv Museum, Suzanne Landau, and now uh, Tanya cohen Uzieli, they came directly from, from the Israel, Israel Museum. Museum. So actually, they're ours. <laughs> uh, and there were some other um, less known museums which are directed by, by women. Uh, so I think that the, the feminine uh, presence in the art world, world of, uh, of Israel is very significant and very prominent. But it's improving all over. Yeah. But you have yeah. the question as well? One question. The, the title of your discussion is oh. The Women of Mat Shagal Uses and Managers. Mm -hmm. My question is, are there also dealers of this work? Mm -hmm. Did they, I don't know, did they do business? Uh, Whether they were also dealers? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Bella and Virginia, absolutely not. I think that Vava had, can be called a kind of a dealer, yeah. But, but not, 
Yeah, a kind a of a dealer, not, not a real dealer, but a kind of a dealer. Yeah. Y Yeshagal had his dealers, like Emi Ma, who was really uh, occupying a lot of his business, who also was then in the late years uh, in Saint Paul de Vence. He had like patrons and he had like publishers for yeah. his uh, uh, lithographs, mm. yeah, in, uh, in France. Um, I, d I don't think he had like uh, one significant dealer mm. that, uh, that went with him through a long way. Yeah. You walk around and you remember what, have, what you have seen from Chagall, and there's one thing which stuns me. Yeah. He is painting a story, wonderful story. Yeah, he's a storyteller. Story he, he is not exactly painting a woman. If you look at the, at the female figures in the paintings, yeah. is, it, is it an idea? Well, that is a series, I know. But is it an ideal he has? It's always the same type and not very elaborate. There is no, 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 no real portrait in the painting. Yeah. Did he ever talk about it? Did he ever talk mm -hmm. about his relationship to women? Or are we only guessing? Uh, no, yeah, I think we are most of the time we are guessing, yeah. But you can see that actually, you know, that um, Bella, Virginia, and Vava they had some, si they were, uh, there was quite resemblance in their face, yeah. I think he chose the same type of, uh, of a woman, and but you can see the, the differences, of course. Uh, but actually, I think that he like elaborated the, the, the three faces um, uh, to an ideal uh, format, to an ideal, like, um, ideal image of a woman. So, so actually, I think that that's what we see. Uh, you're totally right. He, he developed his ideal yeah. of a female person, also of other persons. It's always his style. I mean, yeah. what we see here is the Cosmo of Chagall, and he painted his own world. And this is why it's so recognizable. If you uh, meet people in Hong Kong or in uh, Shanghai, they all, if they know something, recognize a Chagall on the wall. Yeah. It's very significant what he, what he created, his own world. But I would like to come back on uh, generalizing the idea uh, uh, of the situation of women. And I think as well, not only in Israel, but all over the world, we see an increase, immense increase of women in powerful positions, especially in state museums. And, uh, I mean, you're very young and, uh, and Schulz is very clever. But I mean, of <laughs> course, he has chosen you not because you are a young, blonde woman, you said, but because you are intelligent and yes, eager. Yes, I was waiting for you. Yeah, you cannot say this, I uh, know. <laughs> intelligent, eager, hardworking, the future of maybe such a business. But as I, uh, I remember, your partners is only one man. You have three women, one man in the yeah. business. Yeah, you yeah. see. Yeah. Elisabeth is very um, female in a way, um, but yes, I think of course um, it's not, um, that's, that was not the point I wanted to make that it's um, like most important to be a female and then there comes what um, yeah. you're able to do. Now of course it's always about your content and your expertise and the quality of your work, but um, I do see this change um, with more and more women popping up everywhere. Um, with great interest because um, it's relevant to have a society that builds up all of us and I'm curious to know because I have no idea honestly if there are um, many female artists with their male muses I'm sure they exist and um, Cecil Brown Yes, for example or um, Georgia O'Keeffe and Stieglitz they were maybe in a way very um, closely working together and with um, great connected minds on equal levels, so there are examples. But um, And I don't want to have the super feminist position only, but I think it's a relevant um, dynamic in our society at the moment. I understood that. And I like it. Yeah, it's absolutely necessary, otherwise you never come in the position. 
because you have 500 or 2,000 years of disadvantage. Yeah. So you need the support of, uh, of strong men. And, uh, and uh, t just to come back once more to the story, we are representing Chris Reinecke. She's an artist in her 80s now, and she was the wife of Immendorf. And she was studying at the academy in Düsseldorf with uh, Gerhard Höhme. And a fellow student was uh, Sigma Polke. And uh, she actually stopped doing art because she could not stand anymore the insults she got from her colleagues and uh, how, how she was treated in the, in the academy. She was like, everybody could touch her, everybody could make fun with her. She was just some, there were no women, yes? So, and Immendorf was, of course, a super macho. And he developed then, after the, the beginning of an idealist uh, uh, way of doing art to get commercial, and then she made the right decision. I mean, she is the really artist and said, no, I'm not going any further because you are uh, dismissing our ideal, uh, ideal uh, ideas for the, for the utopia to make the world better. Yes, there was the legal, um, how do you say, the legal happening in the academy. Mm -hmm. So they were really fighting for better food, for better living. And then he started to paint because he could sell it better. So it was really easy like that. And she stopped doing art for a whole time. And then now she began 20 years ago. And she's a great artist, but no one knows her. And she was really destroyed by the man's world. And if I look what we're doing today, it will be a women's world in the future. A better world. And then a better world, of course. I'm totally <laughs> your opinion. <laughs> okay, Just also Tobias. To bring, to bring up another important woman being discovered nowadays is Yaya Kusama. In, in, Kusama. in Germany, she's not that much known, but when I told my, my friend in New York mm -hmm. that there's a Kusama retrospective in, in Berlin, it was unfortunately during the corona pandemic, she was so jealous mm -hmm. because uh, she told me she was standing nine hours in front of. Um, Whitney Museum and couldn't uh, couldn't get a ticket and uh, well mm -hmm. but Gusava she also was uh, in the 60s in America and what what you were telling about uh, this lady it was the same nobody took her serious mm -hmm. and she lives in an institution for people with mental illness for 40 years in Tokyo now but now with her uh, polka dot pumpkins she she races as a star but she's 90 years old until she became the star she is right now mm -hmm. and for decades no Nobody took her serious with her polka dots everywhere. Mm. You're not totally right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because Kusama uh, had contacts to the Zero movement in Germany, and she's yeah. been in Germany. Yeah. And Heinz Mack, whom we are representing yeah. exclusively worldwide, was a friend of her, and I was discussing, uh, discussing with him. And she, from the group, she, she was accepted. So, uh, Oeka, Piene, Manzoni, she was accepted as one artist. There were only few. I only remember Dada Maino, and is there another? The Adolf Mandavigo, three artists of the Zero Group, artists, female artists, and about 30 male. And the three, I think, were. Uh, accepted as artists, as women artists. Uh, so Kusama, but this we're talking about the late 50s and 60s. Which but we could actually change to um, Laiko, who you represent too. Yeah. Because she's like a prominent female artist and her husband <coughs> is taking care yeah, exactly. of so much in the background. Yeah, that's right? a good example. Leko Ikemura, a Japanese artist who is very successful at the moment, and she will be here actually on another talk. She's a Japanese artist, and as you know, the Japanese uh, are very, very fond of Chagall. So many Chagalls were sold to Japan. Uh, they are really crazy. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting a female contemporary artist sees Chagall and she sees him in a very special way so I'm very looking forward to this to this uh, to this talk and you're totally right there it is vice versa mm -hmm. but this is today not the 50s yeah yeah
So we, you see, it, it's all proof that it changes. I'm also the only man on the stage. <laughs> Still, <laughs> 10 years, I'm not anymore here. Uh, Alexander. <clears throat> I, 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 want, I definitely don't want to say that the sweet work is now for the females. <laughs> if you want to push me in this direction, no, no I'm not saying this. <laughs> no, what are the facts? Who are the buyers? Hmm. Can you say something? The, I, I don't know about, uh, the about Chagall in, in, you know, in the art business, but I can say that Chagall is still ve very relevant. We have, for example, a traveling exhibition that, you know, and Oh, this is the most popular traveling exhibition of the Israel Museum. The last, yeah. last time it traveled to Korea, to Seoul, and it was a great success. I think there were like... More uh, than 11,000? Yeah, sorry. Oh <laughs> so I won't say how we many... We have 11,000. Yeah. And now we are planning, as you know, uh, uh, to, and then our next traveling exhibition is to Milan. Yeah, to Italy, and uh, I, so I think he's still very popular yeah. all over the world. I don't know men or... Men yes, I would um, say, of course, um, as a person looking at the bidders and buyers, it's again um, more the men. But interesting, Alexander, as we know each other, um, I can be so frank, your, your question is referring to this kind of, um, wie sagt man das, in, in eine Box stecken, so ein bisschen, it's sweet and feminine and not, not um, sorry, not cruel and male. So male I think question. this is a good point to start the conversation upstairs with a glass of wine because I hope that we can, you know, all be everything. So I think this is, as art should be fascinating for every human being looking at it. Some find it's too sweet, some think it's dreamy and just wonderful and magical and um, in the end I think it will address every one of us but um, from my pers perspective it's um, yeah men who buy and bid but mm -hmm. this is not the picture um, of falling in love with an artwork mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah well and then about the, the thing about the bidding um, only males are bidding or only men are bidding we've heard it lovely story yesterday with the net theory how mm -hmm. she did for this wonderful yeah. love and yeah. trading and that was long ago yeah. she said it was yeah. 71 or she is an exception <laughs> this lady is an exception <laughs> in all kind <laughs> yeah she's yeah. there yeah yeah Teresa I, I listen to you talk and there are a lot of uh, memories rushing through my head because I, I, I used to work for the National Gallery and I had the privilege of um yeah, I was there when, when Indor put his exhibition at the Neunationalgalerie, Gallery, and at that time he was together with Ola Jauna, who is a young artist as well, and I don't actually know how she is doing since mm -hmm. he died, mm -hmm. but I remember during he built up the exhibition, it was always, I mean, he was too much old, I was really scared of him, I have to say, <laughs> oh. very scary then, although he was very ill at yeah. that time already. And um, the interesting part was that the curator was Annette Hüsch, who became like also one of the first um, directors in a museum in, in, in Germany. She's at the Kunsthalle in Kiel, like she's the director. But Indorf at that time, he was always like, where's my wife? So he was always really harsh. He was always yelling around like, where's my wife? <laughs> and then she would always like, she was this angelic yeah. figure like, yeah coming in and I was really impressed yeah. at, at her like because she is also so very beautiful and 
yeah. but took herself also very seriously as an artist. Absolutely. And, um, but at that time, didn't want to decide anything without her. And mm -hmm. although she didn't speak very much, it was almost her presence just mm -hmm. made him decide what he had to do. That's mm -hmm. what the expression I got. Mm -hmm. And then also, uh, for example, Hiroshi Sugimoto, when he was there, his wife was the boss. Like it was nothing, it was like every interview, everything would just go to her. Like she would decide how long, how he would talk to anyone. And it was just, um, yeah, like very um, interesting how the different artists, for example, most male artists, they always came with their partners and they always, like they would, um, yeah, ask for guidance almost a little bit and they would always make sure their partner would be there and um, but all the female artists that like for example Karen Simon or so it was always clear that the, the women would always stand alone and they would not have a partner or someone who they would directly refer to as a muse or someone to to mm -hmm. sort of like hold on to they would always have to make sure that they are like strong within themselves. Mm -hmm. And I was also thinking why it's changing now, and you said that um, it always takes men basically who make the space. It's also for the uh, prize of the National Gallery. It was like at the beginning was only male jury members. So, and then in over the years, over the 15 years that I was there, I, I, I noticed more and more women came into the jury and then more and more women were also selected into the like to, to be nominated uh, for the prize, and we also had one year where there were only women. So I don't know, it's changing. It's changing, it's changing it's definitely. Changing. Yeah, I, I think we have to. Okay, okay, so I think. I thank if, you all very much. If I may yes, please. Co host, yeah. also thank you Absolutely. so much. <laughs> uh, because we are uh, doing this together. We also, this is in the, in the framework of our dialogue series of bridging the gap. So, bridging the gap Absolutely. between men and women, between artists and, um, and, the, and the scene. And uh, I think it was most entertaining. Thank you so much. And we learned also a lot. And I think as a woman, I'm worked as a manager, but I would <laughs> also love to be a muse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Some sweets, I hope you like. <laughs> 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 